Today is the fifth um, energy storage TCP on seminar. I'm very happy. It's already the fifth month we continue. Um, it's the first version today we uh, make the uh, energy storage TCP invites. And I'm very happy about the two speakers we have today. We have uh, Susanna Dubrovkova um, from the World Bank and the Energy Sector Management System Program. Um, she will start with her talk. I'm very uh, happy that she um, participating today. And the second talk will be from uh, uh, Victoria Martin. She is the subtask leader of the task 35 and also works at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So, okay, with this, uh, we'll directly um, open the stage uh, for you, Susanna. Okay. Thanks so much for the invite and thanks for the introduction, Stephanie. Uh, so my name is Susanna Dobrotkova. I'm senior and specialist at the World Bank. Uh, I work for a unit that is called ESMA, the Energy Sector Management Assistance Program. Uh, this is a global unit uh, within the World Bank's Energy and Extractives Group, um, and our unit is uh, fully financed by donors, mostly Europeans, um, and it's aimed to promote it's aiming to promote decarbonization of energy sector as well as energy access. Uh, we do a lot of knowledge work um, and we support through grant funding, uh, all sorts of preliminary analyses for developing countries, oftentimes pre-feasibility studies, roadmaps, um, and other market analyses for, for energy access, and renewable energy and efficiency, um, as well as fundamentals of, of energy sector. Um, so it's just for you to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so this talk will focus on, on two things, on the energy storage program at the World Bank. Uh, so, you know, how do we go about energy storage? Why are we doing it? What kind of projects we see in developing countries? And then I'll also speak about the energy storage partnership, uh, which, uh, you know, we are coordinating out of ESMAP. It's a partnership of, by now, 41 partners uh, that collaborate on energy storage and in particular, um, you know, kind of longer term issues of energy storage that you will see. Um, so let's get into this. Um, so I probably don't have to explain to this group that energy storage is key to accomplishing uh, not only our climate goals, but also SDG 7 goals, both in terms of renewable energy as well as energy access, actually. Um, and energy storage is also super important for energy security. Now, at the World Bank, of course, we focus on developing countries mostly. Though, of course, we look also into lessons from developed world. And in developing countries, energy storage is actually probably more important than in, in, de in developed countries because in developing countries, the grids oftentimes are smaller, weaker, um, and many developing countries actually don't have too many sources of flexibility in their system. So when you think about, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa or island states, most of these countries don't have gas, they'll never have gas. Um, and have very little flexible hydro. Um, and they are oftentimes not particularly well connected to their neighbors. Um, and so the sources of flexibility are really lacking uh, and energy storage kind of comes as a, as a quick solution that can be quite you know, versatile to, for, for the issues that they're facing. Um, as we know, you know from relatively recent episodes of, of different uh, climate disasters, um, in particular in Caribbean region, for example, uh, storage combined with solar can really improve grid resilience. These are systems that can be back online after a big storm, you know, within hours, sometimes minutes, uh, tend to perform better than, than fossil-based systems. Uh, so, so there is an important angle there, in particular for island states, I would think. Now, of course, Storage is important uh, to provide grid services, in particular uh, as countries are trying to phase out uh, fossils that are typically providing these services. Uh, in developing countries, storage is super important for replacing dirty thermal picking plants, as well as backup diesel generators. These are absolutely you know, everywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, half of Nigeria's power system is basically diesel generator backups that are running in everyone's backyard. These could be replaced by, by solar plus storage. 
Um, and in most of developing countries, uh, their evening, their peak of demand is in the evening. Uh, so solar doesn't help unless you link it with storage. Uh, and then you can be you know, shifting solar power into the evening and you are replacing in that case, extremely expensive and typically you know, very old, very dirty, either HFO plants or, or diesel gensets. So very important role there. Um, and of course, you know, this replacement is happening completely on competitive basis um, because oftentimes in developing countries, uh, this kind of last, uh, you know, last resort thermal pickers are operating at more than one dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, and then, of course, you know, storage is already helping in achieving energy access. In all the mini grids, you will have storage devices and some of the whole solar home systems as well. Um, now, what do we do at the World Bank um, in terms of storage? Um, we started to realize already five, six years ago that as the costs of storage were coming down, that uh, storage in particular in combination with solar was becoming very competitive uh, in developing countries because their costs of generation are much higher than in the developed world. Uh, and also because um, they, they had much fewer options for uh, what, what could be their local generation. And so we started to, to look into those projects of solar plus storage typically. Also by performing grid integration studies, we realized that, that storage will be very important in these countries uh, as they're trying to adopt solar and wind. Um, and so we, we launched the dedicated battery storage investment program which was announced uh, in 2018. Uh, in that program, we announced several targets. So one of them was $1 billion of World Bank Group uh, financing for, for energy storage in developing countries, and then additional targets of leveraging $1 billion of climate co-finance for these projects and about $3 billion of private investments. Um, this doesn't mean that the World Bank is only focusing on battery storage. We do support also uh, pumped hydro or thermal storage, but of course these projects are much more rare. Um, you can imagine, uh, so thermal storage, for example, you know, we've been involved uh, in, in all the projects in Morocco. Uh, pumped hydro, for example, there is one real large scale project uh, that we have just approved in Indonesia. So this is still happening. Uh, however, battery storage is taking probably the most space uh, in terms of energy storage projects. Um, now, as we started to work on these projects, we realized that uh, the needs of developing countries uh, are different than the needs of developed countries, and that they are oftentimes not particularly well covered, uh, neither in literature, nor in policy advice, nor in the offer of technologies that are out there. Um, so developing countries, as you can imagine, you know, uh, they oftentimes have very difficult just climatic conditions. Uh, some of these countries, you know, have temperatures that are persistently above 40 degrees. Some of them go up to 50. Uh, imagine, you know, um, all the countries in the Sahel, for example. Then, you know, a lot of dust, uh, which can also be an issue. And then relatively, you know, poor uh, operation and maintenance standards. And then also just uh, you know, questions around how quickly and how often you can get technicians to, to remote areas. Um, so you know, we, we thought that it would be important to, to start some thinking about solutions that would be more appropriate for, for these uh, circumstances. Uh, as you can imagine, lithium ion, you know, um, it should theoretically withstand all of these conditions. Um, however, we know that you know, if your air conditioning or other cooling system breaks on lithium ion, that can be an issue relatively quickly. Now, if you are in the middle of Sahara Desert, you won't have your HVAC technician coming anytime soon. So uh, you know, uh, we're trying to look into solutions that are more robust uh, for, for these climatic conditions as well as um, just the operation and maintenance practices. And we are also very interested in solutions uh, that uh, don't have huge issues with flammability or toxicity. Again, just uh, because of you know, 
the difficult conditions that that uh, these technologies would face uh, in being deployed in in remote areas uh, with relatively poor operation and maintenance standards. Uh, so you know we don't have a particular comparative advantage at the World Bank to do any R and D, um, and so what we have decided to do is to to call kind of coalition of willing. Uh, around energy storage, which we call the energy storage partnership. And uh, energy storage partnership is basically more of a kind of knowledge and research arm uh, that helps us uh, in, in our own battery storage program, uh, but also you know, creates more of a longer, longer term uh, knowledge work uh, and potentially also a bit of research. Uh, and what we bring to the energy storage partnership is precisely kind of lessons learned uh, from the projects that we see on the ground in countries where you know many labs or universities don't necessarily um, go too often or have access to. Um, so just to show you uh, in terms of projects what we are currently you know doing at the World Bank, uh, we have a very active portfolio in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in Asia, uh, a little bit happening in, in Europe and, and Central Asia as well. Um, and a few mostly island situations in Latin America um, and the Caribbean. Uh, our typical projects would be in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, basically solar plus storage, uh, though some of the projects uh, are also just pure storage for, for grid services. Um, a lot of uh, different versions of, of diesel genset replacements. Um, you will have, you know, extremely weak grids in places like Abu Verde or Central African Republic. Uh, we are speaking, you know, Central African Republic, the entire grid is 20 megawatts uh, that serves just part of capital city and, and that's it. Uh, so there we are um, bringing solar plus storage. Uh, to improve their situation. Uh, so very diverse portfolio. And I will show you later on uh, in my presentation, a few examples of particular projects where we can go into details, uh, but quite a bit happening. Um, so uh, most of the projects that I've presented here uh, are already, you know, either bank approved. So, you know, the money has been already approved by the World Bank board uh, going to these countries. And uh, so they're working on implementation of the projects. And some of them are in really advanced stages of you know, basically going for the board approval. Uh, so, so this is pretty kind of firm you know, map of what, what we are supporting. Uh, we have very advanced stages of projects in India, South Africa, Central African Republic, Gambia bunch of Pacific Islands and Maldives. In all of these, we are literally in procurement stage of battery storage. Uh, the South Africa results in particular should be announced very soon. Uh, India results have been already announced. So, so this is really happening. Then, and uh, both India and South Africa projects are also of significant size. Um, now, so back to energy storage partnership, which is probably of most interest to this group. So the objective of the energy storage partnership is to foster international cooperation, to help to develop, and more importantly, to adapt energy storage solutions uh, tailored to the needs of developing countries. And here I really mean, you know, the more difficult uh, just weather conditions and climate conditions, but as well as uh, more difficult maintenance uh, in, you know, in poor countries with remote areas. Um, and also potentially more difficult use cases, as you can imagine, you know, if you're doing a remote mini grid, you will not have an electrician there all the time or an HVAC person there all the time. Uh, so, you know, catering to, to these more, more remote situations in hotter weather, in more dusty weather, or more humid weather than what we would see in Europe or, or North America. Uh, the main functions of an energy storage partnership is really to convene um, international cooperation to 
increase the knowledge base around energy st storage solutions with particular focus on developing countries, um, create uh, a bit of capacity building by you know, convening different experiences together, sharing them and sharing them potentially with developing countries. Um, then understanding of what are uh, the technical requirements for storage solutions in developing countries. And again, you know, this may differ slightly from developed world. Um, and then uh, our role really here is to inform um, the, you know, the, the battery storage providers as well as labs about what would be needed for developing countries. So inform their innovation processes. Um, and at the same time, for us, then the job is to promote uh, the new solutions that we see as promising uh, that, you know, uh, that are for the moment too small for people to, to notice. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, when partners speak to us, uh, that creates for them opportunities to, to inform, you know, their investments and for us opportunity to, to inform our policy dialogue with developing countries. Um, and of course, access to country specific and specific uh, information, which we see in our own projects, but you know, other partners, we have also other development banks as partners in the partnership. So, uh, so there is potentially also some sharing uh, from, from those projects. Um, as of this month, we have 41 partners. Uh, as you can see, there is a bunch of universities and research institutes, uh, as well as some governments. Uh, development banks, IEA, IRENA, um, we have, uh, you know, USDOE and, and many others. Um, this is, uh, you know, really the side of, of research and development and, and knowledge creation. This doesn't mean that we don't speak to the private sector, we do. Uh, we consider them, however, to be a stakeholders group. So they inform our thinking and um, our work program. They don't get to decide on the work program because of course, uh, then they would have conflict of interest because most of them want to bid on the actual projects that are implemented on the ground. Uh, so, you know, we have this ring fencing of being informed by the private sector and having, uh, you know, particular fora where we speak to the private sector. Uh, but our actual work is decided just between the partners um, that, you, that you see here. Uh, private sector is, however, kind of at you know arm's length. Uh, here, represented by energy storage associations from Europe, from US, China. Um, we have some others. Um, yeah. Anyway, you will can see all the logos. Um, now, what do we do? Uh, in energy storage partnership, how we organize ourselves is we have kind of rotating topics and, and we tend to hold seven kind of working groups. Uh, you can see the topics of the different working groups. Some, you know, uh, collaborate more than others and uh, different institutions kind of come and go um, based on, you know, their interest and uh, also kind of current staffing and, and financing. Uh, this is a, a voluntary, uh, you know, collaboration. So everyone comes with their own staff, with their own uh, budgets. Uh, and it's really just a space to, to create a bit of cross fertilization. If people are working on similar topics and they agree that it would be beneficial to collaborate on a given topic, then that's what we enable. Um, and over the last few years, we've been, you know, creating not only a bunch of publications that you can see below, um, but, but also a, a few tools like the Solar Plus Storage uh, app that is publicly available. Uh, we also uh, use this partnership to, to run basically a capacity building program for developing countries. Uh, as well as a bunch of technology focused seminars. You might have attended some of these. Um, then we, we run a Women in Energy Storage Mentoring program with GWNet. Uh, one cohort was already fully uh, mentored <laughs> during pandemics. Um, and we are right now uh, under recruitment for the second cohort. We actually already chosen the, the mentees and they will be announced soon. 
uh, and we connect them with mentors. Some of them will develop to others in developing countries and, uh, and they will be in the mentorship program for another year. Um, one interesting activity that we are trying to, to well, not start because we've been on it for a while, but make happen are energy storage test beds. Uh, we would like to have those established in Morocco, South Africa, and India. And in each of these countries, we have a willing partner that uh, you know, uh, has research capabilities to, to run a test bed. These test beds shouldn't be uh, testing storage in labs, but this should be you know, testing of actual containerized or other solutions, full solutions, uh, again, to the conditions of developing countries. So having them in, for example, in Moroccan desert, um, and test it for you know, unstable power supply, how they behave in those conditions, uh, can they recover from power outage easily, how easy they are to service, uh, what kind of you know, uh, operation and maintenance issues one can in encounter. And the, the point of doing this in developing countries is that what we see oftentimes on the ground, me, for example, I work quite a bit in West Africa, is that when we propose to, uh, to the local power utility or you know, ministry that they should deploy energy storage, um, they're very hesitant to be kind of guinea pigs. They don't believe that it will necessarily work in their system. And you know, the argument that this has been deployed in Germany or in the US doesn't really work uh, because for them, these are not comparable conditions. Um, and they have a point, right? Uh, now, this doesn't mean that we can go and deploy, you know, some uh, uh, grant funding in every single country, uh, but when you can show them that uh, the systems were deployed in relatively comparable conditions, so, for example, in Moroccan desert, and, you know, they can go to see it, they can go to speak to the technicians, uh, share experiences, uh, that brings it kind of closer to home for them and it becomes more more tangible as a solution. Um, and so the idea of having the test beds in Morocco, South Africa, and India uh, is really to serve, you know, through the Moroccan and South African test bed, most of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, for, you know, potential solutions as well as sharing of experiences. Um, and India, you know, potentially, of course, the Indian market is, is very large, but, but potentially also for the rest of the subcontinent there. That's the idea behind the test beds. Um, now, let me speak a little bit about you know, what we see on the ground as, as actual projects that the World Bank is currently supporting. Uh, these are you know, all public knowledge, um, financing approved by the World Bank Board and in different stages of implementation. Uh, so first of all, South Africa uh, project, uh, this is battery energy storage program, really not just a project uh, that we are doing with ESCOM. Uh, so as part of our support to ESCOM and to help them out with grid integration of, of variable renewables that they contracted are under their REIPP program, um, we have um, undertaken analysis in South Africa of the entire grid. Uh, to see where energy storage would be valuable in the given grid um, and you know, having in mind also what kind of projects were, uh, um, were chosen uh, here in RAPP round five. Um, and we had come up with that analysis with 35 sites in South Africa where storage would be valuable. Some of those are to basically hybridize storage um, or at least co-locate with renewables. Others are pure storage, more for grid services. Um, and now we are in the process of basically tendering out different packages uh, of these projects um, you know, um, as we speak. The first phase, which was 200 megawatts, uh, 800 megawatt hours of battery storage. I think it was in eight different locations, if I'm not wrong, uh, was already tendered out and the results should be announced very soon. Uh, there will be a second phase following up. 
Um, the, the projects from the first phase are hoped to be operational next year. Uh, what's interesting in this particular project is not only that it's so large, uh, what I find interesting is that it's in so many locations um, because that will allow several different use cases to be basically showcased once, uh, once these are operational. It also quite naturally allows for many different companies uh, to, to get through the tender because there are many different lots, you know, that are that are tendered out at the same time. Um, so I I think it will be interesting to see then in the implementation phase how things are going and you know who's doing better, who's doing not so great, uh, and also how the different use cases worked out. Um, and then of course this is South Africa, uh, which on one hand you know really cares about bringing socioeconomic benefits to the to the country. On the other hand, uh, South Africa is of course very rich in, in different minerals and could position itself uh, on the value chain of battery storage, in particular for, uh, for vanadium-based battery storage. Uh, so I think this program can potentially be interesting also from that point of view uh, that you know, uh, probably in the second phase in particular, because it's a little bit further down the road, we could see uh, some of the flow batteries getting through, uh, and this would, uh, you know, support the local job creation uh, and increase of, of skills in the country, uh, which are actually implicitly, uh, not explicitly, uh, explicitly incorporated uh, in the tender. Uh, so I think that's that's interesting part part of that um, particular uh, project. Of course, it's not rare in South Africa to see this, but it's very rare to see in other countries, and I think. Um, it's interesting best practice and potentially something that, that also in Europe, people are starting to think about how to, how to localize production of batteries. Um, so potentially something to look into. Now, uh, the second project, uh, and these are not the real pictures from Burkina Faso because the project doesn't exist yet. Uh, the second project is Burkina Faso Solar Park. Um, and uh, it's actually very, large and quite complex project of the World Bank, where the World Bank is uh, supporting Burkina Faso on several fronts. Uh, so one component of, of the project is uh, solar park plus storage. Uh, second component uh, is actually uh, quite a bit of mini grids, which also has storage in them. And then uh, there is also a support through standalone uh, battery storage to the local utility, um, which is called Sonabel, uh, for frequency and voltage control, as well as dealing with grid integration of uh, several small scale uh, solar plants that already operate in Burkina Faso. Uh, the solar park uh, will be an IPP um, and, uh, you know, the World Bank is supporting uh, the tender uh, preparation for the solar park plus storage. And the whole idea of having storage there is that the solar park will have to basically deal with, with its own short-term variability caused by the clouds. Uh, and it will also provide uh, a bit of power to the evening peak. It will not be able to cover the entire evening peak just yet uh, because of the costs. Um, but uh, you know it will displace quite a bit of HFO-based power in the evening peak. Um, so you know within one single project uh, that we have approved a year ago, uh, I think, well, a little less than a year ago, you see several you know use cases of batteries deployed uh, in a country that has you know. Uh, a relatively small grid that is not yet very well interconnected with the neighbors, and a grid that is basically purely based uh, on HFO uh, and diesel, and you know very little hydro and a lot of imports from neighboring countries. Now, probably the most interesting case and very advanced in, in terms of grid integration of variable or renewables is Maldives. Uh, Maldives are a country that the World Bank has been supporting in their 
renewable energy journey for the last almost 10 years. Um, and the, the top picture that you see with, with a lot of rooftop solar, that is actually rooftop solar supported by the World Bank uh, on the main island in Mali. Um, and as you can imagine, in island states, you actually really quickly you know, run out of space for solar, even if you cover all the roofs. Uh, and at the same time, uh, bringing solar is really important. These are very remote islands. Uh, so, you know, their entire original power system was basically diesel generators. Uh, it's extremely expensive to run. Um, it's also not particularly reliable because sometimes, you know, ship the diesel doesn't come and then your whole system is done. Um, and so, so we've been supporting solar. Uh, I think the, the first you know, panels went up there in 2015, 16. Um, and uh, very quickly we realized that there will be much more needed uh, for, for the islands to, uh, you know, to get rid of diesel. So not only we have expanded our distributed solar, so you know, rooftop solar program, uh, by now, in the latest projects, we are actively supporting actually near shore floating solar because, again, you know, they're running out of space and they're forced to go into water. Um, and then battery storage to, to integrate all of that solar uh, into the local grid. Uh, but at the same time, we are also thinking about e mobility and how to bring it to the island. And ideally, of course, uh, you know, while we are at the stage that you have diesel and solar coexisting on the island, you don't want the e-vehicles, which would be typically two-wheelers or three-wheelers, you don't want those to be powered by diesel electricity. So how to think about, you know, powering EVs uh, from solar, uh, how to make the whole system work, uh, what does it mean in terms of need for storage? And then, of course, over time, also thinking about how to use EV infrastructure to become an integral part of your power system and uh, possibly serve uh, as storage uh, for, uh, for the grid. Uh, so yeah, uh, our latest project is deploying battery storage, uh, near shore floating solar, uh, and we are in advanced stages of quite sophisticated analysis uh, around e-mobility on the main islands uh, where you know the local populations live. Uh, we have supported also other analytical work that is you know more public, like the energy storage roadmap for Maldives. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll continue with this support uh, further on. Um, this is quite typical menu that you would see in small island developing state. Uh, so you would see similar thinking in Pacific Islands, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the battery storage needs in these cases, uh, they may seem small, but for the sizes of power systems, they're actually very large. So we are currently on the procurement process in Maldives for 40, mega, 40 mega, megawatt hours uh, energy storage system. Um, uh, so these are kind of ideas of our projects. Uh, let me just sum up here. So, you know, our goal at the World Bank is to support developing countries in deploying energy storage. Uh, we do that, of course, through access to concessional finance, uh, either our own or also climate funds, uh, technical assistance, you know, helping out with different studies, capacity building, um, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, you know, we link this to addressing knowledge gaps through the International uh, Energy Storage Partnership that uh, we are convening uh, out of ESMAP. Uh, to date, uh, the World Bank battery storage program has mobilized around 600 million of, of concessional funds for battery storage projects. Uh, we have approved funds for over 4.7 gigawatt hours of battery storage capacity. And we have at about two and a half gigawatt hours in a very active pipeline where we know that these projects will happen. 
Uh, we host the Energy Storage Partnership Secretariat. And the point of the Secretariat is, again, you know, to develop knowledge around storage that is particularly suitable for developing countries. And they are in, interested in, you know, how to set up their regulatory frameworks, safety, warranties that are appropriate for developing countries, reuse and recycling down the road. Uh, then, as I mentioned, they're supporting energy storage test beds uh, to bring newer technologies closer to our countries so that they can get kind of, you know, look and feel of them um, before they're willing to deploy them. Um, we do a lot of knowledge exchange uh, events and we run platforms like Energy Storage Academy and, and technology webinars. Uh, we support women in energy storage mentoring program and collect also best practice around energy storage business models uh, with help of Andreas. Uh, we think about energy sector coupling, which we think will be very relevant for developing countries a few years down the road. Um, and from our own experiences, we collect quite a bit of best practice around energy storage procurement um, because we see very different procurement schemes in, in different countries. Um, so yeah, let me stop here. Uh, you can, if you have questions, you know, feel free to ask or you can write to me. Uh, and SMAP runs a website where you can find some of the publications and links to publications of some of our partners. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Susanna. <clears throat> this was a very nice overview. It's uh, really, uh, it's very impressive how different the, the subjects are. I think there's a lot to consider and you can see there's a lot of work going on. Um, many thanks for your overview. And yeah, the first question, uh, Andreas, please. <clears throat> yes, yeah, Susanna, th thank you very much. Excellent overview. and. It's, it's always impressive to see how many things going on in, within this ES, ESP. Um, and, and maybe just um, explain a little bit uh, why this, this connection to the IEA ESTCP. Uh, so um, we had in, in the very beginning this, this discussion on, on flexible sector coupling, as Susanna now mentioned. Um, and, and I'm very happy that the, the World Bank decided to have a working group on that one. And I think that's that's really really a good idea, especially in this context with the with the uh, developing countries. So I think this this cooperation now between uh, World Bank's ESP, the Energy Storage Partnership, and the IEA uh, task on flexible sector coupling is is very good because it works in two directions. So Susanna is really pushing us hard to make it very concrete to come to the point and and possible uh, projects. So I think this is very valuable. And we on the other side can, can uh, explain about our conceptual ideas. I think Victoria will talk about this later. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, to, to have this cooperation um, and, and I hope this will continue. And we will hopefully have uh, at, at one day some of our new ideas maybe in one of the test beds Susanna um, introduced. So thank you very much. Okay, many thanks uh, for the connection work. <laughs> uh, is there any other question? Uh, okay, if not, I might use the chance and ask. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, you just uh, showed, uh, just take the last example um, with the Maldives, uh, with the islands. Um, I was wondering, once you um, finished uh, the project, do you keep up um, measuring and observing i mean it's like a big field test right it's like already if you once everything is set it up it's a uh, do you have the measurement device and keep on um, tracking everything and maybe then to know if there could be something done better for the next um example so uh you know uh a lot of effort goes to preparation of the project before the money is approved right then we are there still while the money is being disbursed for whatever you know needs to be procured and installed. And you know, that's officially the, the length of the project. So typically, you know, after the approval of financing, we are there for four to seven years, depending on what, what type of project there is. However, in a place like Maldives, um, and you know, in many smaller developing countries, we have an ongoing dialogue where even if the current project closed, we have a new one and it's linked to the previous one. So you kind of roll in, you know, the lessons. 
So for example, you know, I was showing the picture of the Maldivian rooftops, you know, it was the first project was rooftop PV, you know, with participation of private sector, how to, you know, bridge the gap between what should be the price and, you know, what Maldivians can afford. So there was a bit of concessionality, you know, grant to lower down the cost for Maldivians. That project officially closed, right? But we are now there to support, you know, near shore floating solar and battery storage to actually, you know, incorporate all that, all that solar into the system. So, you know, we're still there. And of course we are looking at how the previous project is performing. Um, so, and this is typically the case in particular, you know, in sub-Saharan African countries and in island states where the dialogue is, you know, relatively linear and, you know, uh, small in size. Now, if you're speaking India, right, where we can have 12 energy projects happening at the same time, sometimes it will be more complex and you kind of have to move to a new topic. Um, but we typically have a lot of support on kind of fundamentals of you know, grid integration modeling, planning, and all of that. Uh, and we do it regularly with the countries so that we can see if there are some issues that are popping up and then you can address them by a new project. Okay, that's very interesting. So there's ongoing um, contact. I see. Okay, thanks for answering. Um, and thanks for the talk <laughs> again. And uh, okay, so I would move forward uh, to you, Ms. Martin. If there's any more question, maybe someone can write in the chat and you can have a look and answer if, if it fits for you. And uh, please, uh, Ms. Martin, you can share your screen. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Susanna. Uh, super interesting uh, to hear of your practical um, field applications. So, as Andreas sent a, a teaser, uh, semi-introducing uh, the scope of my talk is uh, to connect um, to the work that's ongoing in one of the tasks within the energy storage, TCP. And this task number 35 is on flexible sector coupling. Uh, so, my name is Victoria Martin. I'm, uh, one of the subtask leader in this project. But um, first, I just give you a very brief overview of the task itself. So you see uh, its goal and objective here is that <clears throat> sector coupling is very much considered in, in uh, a lot of areas of innovation, policy, planning, and so on. But uh, adding the word flexibility uh, to this sector coupling uh, is something that was done and, and the specific objective of this task is to look into how storage can provide flexibility in sector coupled energy systems. So uh, within with this main goal we are doing a lot of things um, where I will talk about uh, the first item there developing the the concept as and the scope and uh, provide uh, insights through a white paper on, on flexible sector coupling. Um, but there are also um, case applications being uh, studied uh, through the partners and reported on, and we're collecting information to inform up on these various aspects, uh, like what are the storage technologies that we could look into, uh, can we find uh, many technologies could be ready, but there are other non-technical barriers uh, for energy storage? And uh, what are some of the most promising uh, configurations that we, we can send forward after the completion of this task? So it's organized into subtasks, but to some extent, uh, the work in these subtasks are overlapping. Uh, it looks very boxy here, but we have a very vivid and interactive discussion uh, in an iterative way uh, between the subtasks. Uh, at any rate, the first one, which I'm in charge of, uh, is on the concept development. And then number two looks at uh, configuration of uh, and storage technology specifications where we collect existing and, and, and describe potentially future storage applications in the context of sector coupling. 
And then in subtext three, we look at local energy system design. It can be a city or a district level um, of, of sector coupled cases and their operation. And then uh, in number four, we move on to national scale energy systems analysis and try to understand what coupled sectors with the added flexibility of storage uh, brings to the national energy systems. In the end, we hope to provide some very practical policy uh, and planning and research and development recommendations. Um, so subtask one, uh, the main output is to become a, a white paper, um, but in there uh, we, we want to present um, some sort of organized definition um, that relies on a variety of technologies for energy storage. And we want to highlight um, the enabler of, of uh, energy storage and the flexible, flexible sector coupling to support sustainable development in all its dimensions. And also um, find opportunities for innovation uh, that we feel are there, but we also have to master bottlenecks uh, in the sense that markets and policy presently might be hindering the integration of storage and, and the concept of flexible cyclic coupling. So some more details here. Uh, uh, I don't have to go over it, but um, we can move to the next so we can have more time for discussion. At any rate, um, the annex or this subtask started off uh, with just <laughs> thinking about what, what's, what are sectors. And we had a kickoff meeting or a task definition meeting in, in October of 2019 where uh, all the partners or participants came to this picture that I show you. It's a very much in the eyes of the beholder how you define a sector. And we realized that we need to allow for this diversity in thinking and not come and proclaim one solution. At the same time, uh, when we talk about sector, we have to organize the work within the task uh, in some sensible way to put the focus on storage, which is our intention. So going from there, we can see that right now we have arrived at something like this, which also describes the scope of the work that we do. And here we focus on, on the electricity sector and primarily then the change towards a renewable electricity uh, sector um, that is relying a lot on fluctuating primary energy sources. And then how this electricity sector can be connected to the thermal sector, which includes applications with a thermal need uh, of heat and cold. And it can be industrial uh, demands, but uh, of course building demands and so on but it's the thermal nature that we, that we uh, describe as one sector. And then on the other hand would be the transportation, the mobility sector, and how these uh, are connected then to the, this renewable electricity generating sector. And uh, the connections comes then from a, a thermal, uh, Carry, uh, energy carrier, such as if we're dealing with district energy, for example, um, and also storage, thermal energy storage. So not only batteries, uh, electrochemical batteries. Uh, we also can connect, and, and this is primarily anyway, between the electricity and the thermal sector. In here, we can have the integration of heat pumps um, but that's just an intermediate enabling technology step. Uh, so our focus is still on, on the thermal energy storage step. And then we have power to gas, to heat, or power to gas, to mobility uh, is the other 
the dimension that we're looking at, power to fuel, you could say. And then um, we can also have electricity um, to mobility uh, via electrical storage uh, or electrochemical storage, I think is included here, like batteries. Um, but also converting, of course, such very high exity content energy could be converted to, to thermal, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, to, to provide heat or cold. So um, this is the present working definition. And then we can ask ourselves again, how will this look at in a year? And we really don't know. So we keep it open. but. I think we have landed in these sectors being what we are trying to describe here. Uh, so just to elaborate a little bit more on this, um, we have of course interaction between storage carriers and then back to the electricity sector, uh, like grid to vehicle and then back to the grid, such concepts are being discussed, but we are not considering this because we are considering uh, the connection of sectors. So it wouldn't be entirely logic to, uh, to, to have a focus just as the mobility being an intermediate connection to go back to the electricity sector. And then power to gas for industrial use, for example, um, hydrogen production uh, and use in steel industry, uh, is not part of our work because that's not necessarily a storage uh, function. It's uh, brought into the steel uh, as a value content. Uh, what we have found then is the need, we start investigating the landscape here uh, and there is a need for regulatory considerations. So one of the things that is most obvious for economy um, is that when you connect sectors, like in this little picture image to the left, um, you, you might end up having multiple taxation in every step due to present policy and regulatory landscape and taxation and so on. Um, and then we, find documents where sec sector coupling is indeed uh, highlighted as something very important, both on the EU level, but also by uh, IRENA. Um, however, while this sector coupling is well recognized, we see a lot um, and it's even promoted. And what we have found is that storage is not sufficiently considered in these applications. Something else that is taking shape now also is that aside from an eye on the regulatory landscape and making sure that policies support instead of hinders flexible sector coupling is that there might be a need for a renewed electricity market. Um, and we see that energy storage can help uh, uh, accomplish this renewable of the uh, electricity market with some very important benefits. So for example, for cost meeting or cost management, uh, storage integrated can work with price arbitrage. And we can allow also energy storage to become the foundation of a capacity market uh, rather than a market uh, on, on just available energy. Uh, we can also see if there could be a parallel or supplemental market for rapid response developing uh, where rapid ramp services could be allowed by energy storages. So there's lots of opportunities for innovation here that I think is quite uh, exciting. So next step, just having a few minutes left here, um, I can say that we started then uh, in April 2020 um, and have worked our way um, in an iterative and lively procedure um, 
where we converge on this flexible sector coupling definition uh, together with the case applications that are being studied in the other subtasks. And we want to engage in stakeholder workshops on, on national levels now to start discussing um, these matters of regulatory landscape and, and electricity market in relation to flexible sector coupling uh, this autumn. And uh, by the end of the task, provide this white paper on flexible sector coupling that we hope can inform more about the importance uh, of storage when we connect um, uh, the sectors. So for that, comments and reflections by, by all of you who are listening are of course uh, welcomed. And you can send such questions to me or ask them now, but we may not have time. Uh, also contact Andreas, of course, who's uh, very much involved in this uh, task. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's a very nice overview of what's going on at the task uh, 35. Um, I think we have time for a question. Um, if there's someone, please just you know, give me a sign digitally. <laughs> okay, so then I use the chance <laughs> to ask <Please>. again. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, I imagine it's a big um, difficulty if you scale it up, right? Like if you're not just in a little province with the different sectors you wanna couple somehow, but if it's uh, like uh, you talked about the EU, so if you have different countries and you want to couple this, would this be even possible if you consider there are different markets and different pricings? Or, uh, you know, what is a realistic scale in the moment for flexible sector coupling? Well, I, I think that there are flexible sector couplings cases already, which we may not think of. And, and that's the combined heat and power integrated with the district heating. And they even work with thermal energy storage. So it def definitely works on the city level. But when it comes to, <clears throat> when it comes to the electricity market and, con and electricity generation in, on, in a power pool, mm -hmm. um, then indeed those are regional and they are very large scale, um, but they are connected. So I think um, if we are going to be able to absorb so much renewable and energy from fluctuating sources, we're gonna have to think how we can connect better to, for example, the, the building sector without using uh, only battery as a storage, for example, that is too expensive. Uh, since the demand in the built sector is heat and cold to a large extent, then why not bring it over there in electricity uh, through a heat pump system, uh, generate uh, heat and store it in a thermal storage uh, at the building site. And, and that should also be possible uh, thinking district energy systems, I think. I don't know if Andreas has a, any other uh, view, but that's my personal view. Uh, no, no, it, exactly. Uh, I agree completely. Um, may, maybe an, an interesting point is that um, in our last meeting, we had a discussion. Um, uh, Victoria said we had one working group on this, let's say, a more local level mm. uh, and another one on the national level. And this local level um, might become very interesting now um, because we, we discussed a little bit how fast can such a, a sector coupling solution be installed. And if we look at this, this let's say local level, it, it, is, it is fascinating that, that we could have uh, for the first time, we have, for example, um, the energy needed for the transportation sector for mobility. Could become from come, could now come from a local source from local renewables, and and to think it that way, it's very interesting to have to have this local solutions for electricity where it all happens, where it all comes in, then also to the to the thermal and to the mobility sector. So to really have a complete solution, 
uh, for for such a uh, let's say a district or or a village or something like that. So I think this this is a very interesting approach, uh, which should be uh, developed further. The next uh, seminar will be held on June uh, Thursday. It will be the twenty third. Um, again at 14 uh, time Central East uh, summertime. And the topic will be about the ESTCP task 34, which is, uh, I think, already now finished or is going to be finished soon. Have this excuse if I don't know the date exactly. Um, the topic is the comfort and climate box and um, at least one or more subtask uh, sub leaders will talk about and sum it up for us to, to tell us what happened in the time during uh, the task was running. So I'm also looking forward to, to this seminar. And yeah, with this, thank you again for participating and for the speakers, of course. And yeah, have a nice uh, afternoon or evening or wherever you're listening, a nice day. <laughs>